Good evening. Welcome to BIP's strategy conversation in which we talk to eminent persons around the world on issues of national and international importance. Our guest today is Ms. Sherry Goodman. Sherry, welcome to the conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we start the discussion, let me briefly introduce our guest today. Sherry Goodman is a senior fellow at the Wind Wilson Center in charge of environmental change and security program and Polar Institute. She's credited with educating a generation of US military and government officials about the nexus between climate change and national security. Using her famous coinage, threat multiplier to fundamentally reshape the national discourse on the topic. A former first deputy under secretary of defense and staff member on the Senate Armed Services Committee, Goodman has founded, led and advised nearly a dozen research organizations on environment, energy, matters of national security and public policy. She is also a senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis and a senior strategist at the Center for Climate and Security. Previously, she served as the president and CEO of Consortium for Ocean Leadership. In her role as vice president and general counsel at CNA or Center for Naval Analysis, she also is a founder and executive director of CNA's Military Advisory Board. The film, The Age of Consequences, in which Goodman is featured, is based on the work of CNA's Military Advisory Board. And I might mention, I also had the privilege of being in the same film. Goodman serves on the boards of Atlantic Council the Resilience Center, the Council on Strategic Risk, the Joint Ocean Commission Leadership Council, and many more. She has previously served on the Responsibility to Protect Working Group, co-chaired by former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. With that very brief introduction to a very illustrious career, I shall start our conversation this evening on issues of policy, climate change, and climate security. Sherry, once again, a very warm welcome to the conversation. Let me begin by asking you, we are watching with interest the coming change in the US administration and with President-elect Biden and President, Vice President-elect Harris coming into the new administration what do you think will be the major policy changes and shifts that are possible? Well, uh, General, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, your audience and warm greetings from Washington, D.C. Uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris have promised um, that this administration will re-engage uh, with the world in a constructive way, and also that climate change will be integrated throughout our foreign policy and national security strategies because of the urgency of the climate crisis and part of the reset from the COVID crisis. President-elect Biden has said we face you know, four, four crises in America and, and many of them around the world today too. COVID, an economic crisis, climate, and racial injustice. And many countries around the world face that. Those are going to be his four priorities. And uh, what that means for those of us who have worked like you many years on climate security is that this will be threaded throughout all of our policies, programs, and practice in every agency and in every international engagement. And I believe that that will be very constructive way to help so many of our economies around the world that are struggling in the wake of the pandemic to recover and reset 
towards a green, clean economy in a way that is more sustainable for our future. Wonderful to hear that. I understand as US re-engages with the world again, how do you think South Asia will feature? It's an important part of the world. It houses some of the major powers. We are also in close proximity to some other major powers. So how will South Asia feature in that re-engagement? Well, I, I think South Asia is obviously strategically and vitally important. Um, you are an economic and transit hub of the, of the world. Uh, you also have a, a vast population and a diverse population um, that's vitally important. You have um, China, a major power right there in your neighborhood. You also have many allies and partners of the United States, your own country um, included. I think that um, South Asia is particularly important as we move to meet the goals of um, our climate goals. Um, when the U.S. rejoins the Paris Agreement, which President-elect Biden has promised he will do on day one, that's going to put us back on a path of meeting those nationally determined commitments. And he has said that um, the U.S. will commit to have a net zero electricity sector by 2035 and a net zero economy by 2050. And Many countries around the world have also laid out those ambitious goals. Um, and in order to make that move towards net zero and to bring climate emissions down closer to the 1.5 degree uh, increase above baseline levels, rather than a runaway climate change scenario, an uncurbed emission scenario of well above that, we need over the next several decades rapidly to transition our economies from a fossil fuel dependence onto more renewable and clean energy. Uh, and South Asia has a big role in that for two particular reasons. One is because um, in much of South Asia has been in energy poverty for many decades. So as more and more people rise into out of poverty into the middle class and have sources of electricity, it's important that they, as much as possible, um, move on to cleaner uh, and greener sources of energy. And secondly, um, because to meet these ambitious climate goals, we, we need to move off coal, most importantly. I mean, we all fossil fuels are in the mix, but coal uh, is the one that um, is going to keep us from meeting our ambitious climate goals. And there's still a lot of coal used uh, both in China and in parts of Southeast Asia. So those are going to be two very important um, objectives. Uh, and I think you have many, many possibilities with your ingenuity, uh, industry, and uh, opportunities to re-engage constructively in, in this glo new global mix. I see. Uh, I also see that the United States is uh, focusing heavily on its Indo-Pacific strategy, or IPS. So how do you think the Biden-Harris administration will pursue these objectives of Indo-Pacific strategy? Okay, well, first and foremost, we recognize that the Biden-Harris administration recognizes that our allies and partners are a source of international strength and that we need to re-engage and constructively address those relationships. Um, and so the, in, in all its dimensions, uh, all of its security, human security, national security, economic um, and trade and other dimensions. So I believe there will be a, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific strategy will lean into that. Um, it will use our allies and partnerships strengthening from the Western Pacific across all the way um, throughout the Pacific across uh, south into South Asia in a way that embraces the needs um, of the region and also works to combat aggressive behavior by China and others in that region. Yeah. Now, there are many facets of that, as you know, General Munir. So, it's important to attend to all of the 
trade, economic, water, climate, food. There are many, many elements, all of which have to fit together um, in a constructive way that meet the needs, both of our allies um, and partners, and the needs of global security. You understand that. As you just mentioned that President-elect Biden has already announced that the United States will go back to Paris Agreement on day one. It is very heartening to hear that. International communities thrilled with this announcement. How do you think this re-engagement and re-entry would be implemented? Well, first, it's very important to know that all of the appointments that President-elect Biden and Harris have so far made um, recognize the importance of climate change and climate security in all that we do. So, and most importantly, um, he has named former Secretary of State John Kerry and former Senator uh, to be a presidential envoy on climate change, which means that uh, John Kerry, uh, who is well known in the international community, was our uh, lead negotiator uh, for the Paris Climate Agreement, will be right out there on day one, re-engaging around the world to let our allies and partners know that America is back. America is back. Uh, we're back at the table. We come back humbly. Uh, we come back to listen and to learn because the world has changed since 2015, since the Paris Agreement was signed. And so that I think is, is going to be very, very important that we first listen um, and we first understand what, what the needs are, but that we do so. And in fact, in virtually every uh, discussion that President-elect Biden has had with a foreign leader um, since becoming the president-elect, he has mentioned the subject of climate change. So this is right at the top of his agenda for every, every international engagement right now. But uh, in what ways do you think that the United States will be able to cover the four lost years when it was completely absent from the agenda? Well, look, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's no doubt that, that the U.S. having been absent created a vacuum. First of all, it, uh, you know, there was a loss of trust in America as a reliable partner. And I think we recognize that. And that's why we come back with humility um, and needing to listen and to learn. Second of all, the vacuum of the absence of American leadership allowed, uh, has allowed others China, Russia, other actors to uh, declare their so-called climate credentials and use them in a way uh, to advance their own national interests, ones that aren't always aligned um, with uh, peaceful uh, prosperity and long-term human interests uh, of the region. And so we need to recognize, um, recognize that uh, and recognize that while there still remains tension and global competition, there also have to be ways of cooperating to achieve these common goals of putting ourselves back on track to address the climate crisis. So much of this will be driven by Secretary Kerry. Am I right to understand that? Well, he is, he is the president's envoy on this. We have a secretary, you know, a nominee for secretary of state, Tony Blinken, who also himself will be very active, the president himself. Uh, I think you'll see this, um, there'll be leadership throughout the cabinet and uh, throughout the White House. So basically, uh, am I right to understand that climate change will be mainstreamed into all policy making both nationally and wherever internationally you're engaging. Yes, that's a great way of putting it. And you know, you and I have worked on this for many years to mainstream climate change into foreign policy and national security decision making. From our uh, strategies, our national security strategies, which um, through the uh, Obama administration at least did include for, for a decade at least since the first CNA Military Advisory Board report, in 2007, a recognition of the threat multiplier impact of climate change. Uh, so, so strategy, policy, plans, programs. I think you'll also see it in procurement 
Uh, I mean, how we buy and what we buy is a major reflection of how we address the climate crisis and how we turn the corner towards greener, cleaner energy and uh, equipment and others. And so militaries, for example, around the world are often big buyers of, of material and logistics in their own country. So that's going to be an important opportunity for the national security community to step up and lead by example. Yes, uh, but talking about Paris Agreement, uh, we were all present there when the agreement was signed in Paris with the negotiations and we were excited. But as we now look back and monitor, are you confident that we are on track to implement the agreement fully? And if that doesn't happen, are we able to cap the global temperature at 1.5 degrees? Because I really get worried when I hear and also read that people are now talking about a two degree world. We are talking also about two degree plus or three degrees. Is that something a possibility? And what would be the catastrophic consequences of that? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I'm deeply worried that, that it will be hard to put global economies back on that 1.5 degree pathway. And as you may know, we, um, we, we did a study last year uh, through the uh, Center for Climate and Security and with the International Military Council on Climate Security to look at um, security threat assessment of those two different warming scenarios. One, which we call the curb scenario, where we get back onto a 1.5 degree uh, warming uh, track, 1.5 degree C. And the second, what people call the uncurbed scenario, where temperatures rise over the next several decades, uh, approximately three degrees or more. And the differences are remarkable, um, General. Uh, they are um, in, the, in the uncurbed scenario, I mean, in the curbed scenario, it still is quite severe. Let's re recognize that a lot of this warming is already baked in to the Earth system. The earth is a system when we have already raised temperatures significantly and sea levels have already risen and polar sea ice is retreating and permafrost is thawing and collapsing even as we speak. Um, uh, and in the three degree warming scenario, some of the impacts, particularly in South Asia, could be uh, towards the catastrophic end with dramatic sea level rise, uh, coastal erosion, storm surge, flooding and inund inundation, making part of coastal areas, including in the U.S., but also in your region, uninhabitable over the over coming decades. That's a frightening scenario, actually, and we all should get worried about that now. But as we do that, I would like to say that it is internationally recognized that you are one of the pioneers of the concept of climate change and security, or the nexus between climate change and security. Do you think the concept is being well understood and acted upon by states and international community? And if not, what should be done to sort of make states understand and realize that this is a place where they need to take action? Uh, what, a, what a good question. I, I think there is growing awareness and, and recognition of it, um, both in a variety of UN forums on climate and security. Um, those focused, I'd say, quite significantly on the human security dimension, which I, I believe is very important, and the food, water, energy nexus. Uh, and I, I think also military and national security professionals around the world uh, have growing awareness. You know, we formed the International Military Council on Climate Security a year ago, and now have over 35 um, member nations affiliated with it. We released the first World Climate Security Report uh, in 20, uh, last year, and uh, we are actually earlier this year, and we are going to be releasing the second one uh, next year in the run-up to COP26. 
And I think that that is, is, uh, documents both the threat and the realities of climate security risks as they are faced by countries around the world, but also the opportunities uh, to, to mainstream, as we say, climate policy into national security and foreign policy. And I think we see more and more of this, and I'm very hopeful that uh, in the Biden administration, that will enable it to be mainstreamed more thoroughly uh, around the world. But Sherry, you know that as chairman of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change, I had started a study with the council in seeing how many states identify climate as a security issue. And it was quite heartening for us to see that over 100 states had identified climate change as a security issue in some form or the other in their national policies and national papers. But it stopped there. They didn't go any further and did not assign any analysis or any response mechanism after identifying that climate change could be a security issue. So I think there is a large gap between identification and preparation. Do you think uh, councils like mine or yours could do anything to do prepare them? Yes, absolutely. I, I agree with you. Uh, there is a gap between you know identification and really evidence-based analysis, and also um, bringing in the professional um, climate expertise into national security and military leadership. Too often today, we find still that um, national security and military professionals say, oh yeah, okay, I, I, I know climate change is an issue. I know it's affecting my military bases or I know it's affecting me how I deploy my forces, but really I'm not an expert about it. So you tell me what to do. And therefore it doesn't get well addressed. So I think we're on the cusp of being able to train a whole new and educate. It's partly training and education that starts from, you know, the earliest years, but can also come at the mid-career and also integrates um, uh, this, the scientific uh, and engineering expertise of climate professionals into the national security planning process so that you have analysis uh, and then you have programmatics. And now there's one other very important thing, which is we often say that a strategy without resources is hallucination. So if you identify a problem, but you don't put any money on it to fix it, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we can have all the plans and pro, you know, studies out there, but still you have to do something with it. And I'm, I'm very hopeful, I'm more hopeful, let's say more hopeful that uh, councils are like we both, you know, we both are affiliated with these international military councils will get some elevated attention and traction within their own defense ministries and foreign ministries and in, in the relevant uh, multilateral and global institutions in coming years to actually put investments into specific projects, whether it's resilience of military bases or greening procurement or actually designing strategies, um, security strategies that help us climate proof, climate proof a region uh, that will actually be meaningful. But when we talk to climate experts or people who are in the business of climate change, there is a great reluctance or a fear that talking about climate security, people are trying to securitize climate change. Is that a genuine fear or you think that it is completely ill-founded? Okay, I, I, th I think there are, um, I think that type of dialogue um, and concern is expressed um, either when um, there's, when, the, when there's not as much knowledge of the actual constructive role of the security community, or because there's a recognition that a lot of the solutions, the ultimate solution set for climate change is not in the armed forces. I mean, we have to lead by example in, in what we do, 
but the actual solution to reducing emissions globally is going to be, for example, in the energy transition. And the major parts of resilience and adaptation are both in the civilian and in the military sector, but the civilian sector, of course, looms very large. So I think that's why uh, that concern, I hear that concern expressed sometimes. I'll tell you what, um, I, I've recently begun to frame this at, because I think we're entering into a new era now where we have the climatization of security. <laughs> um, as we mainstream climate change across national security and foreign policy, we now have the climatization of security. Uh, and that's because it's going to be, you know, front for, at forward in all of our national security and foreign policy. And I think that could be and can be a very positive um, step. Yeah. I know that you've worked with the U.S. military for many years at the policy level. Do you think the U.S. military is preparing enough to take on the role and the responsibilities in the response community of climate change impacts, both at home and abroad? Well, are we ever doing enough? No, nobody's ever doing enough. Um, but uh, are we getting ready to do, have we been doing more and can we do more? Yes. Um, you know, just in the last year, uh, let's say in the U.S., even though, you know, we, we've um, had a climate denier uh, or some say climate arsonist uh, at, the, uh, at the head of, of the U.S. government, despite that, um, the Department of Defense has developed a climate assessment tool to use throughout the U.S. Department of Defense and on our military infrastructure. That's being put in place now and at least 150 military bases uh, are going to be assessed using this new tool. Um, so that's one sort of imp important, important piece of data. Uh, at the same time, I see, um, uh, you know, there's increasing efforts to uh, assess uh, resource competition, environmental security, and stability as a holistic approach uh, throughout a variety of foreign policy planning processes including recently in, so, in, the, in something called the Global Fragility Act. Uh, so you see that climate considerations entering into domains of foreign policy planning like uh, global fragility and humanitarian uh, relief efforts and um, in ways that previously they've been considered kind of off on the side. So I do think that mainstreaming uh, is coming. Now, I also think what will happen, hopefully, in a Biden-Harris administration is that you'll also see um, national security and defense leaders integrating climate change into their military-to-military -military engagements. That had not previously been often the case, um, uh, that the U.S. was leading to say in its engagement with um, uh, another, you know, it's mill-to-mill -mill engagement, either in NATO circles or in um, countries in Southeast Asia, that yes, climate change should be one of the, the dimensions of our mill-to-mill -mill relationship. Yes, uh, but uh, what is really needed is not only the interaction between the different parts of the government, the different agencies of the government, but we need a sort of a seamless transition or work amongst all the organs and amongst all the institutions of the government. And that's the only way I think we can bring a whole of government's response to the threat of climate change. And I completely agree that that's the way you think it should go. But uh, also coming back to another point, I know that you have talked about this previously in many places, that one of the largest polluter as an organization is the military. So how do you think we should work in greening the military, for example? Well, yes, you, you're right. I mean, in the US, uh, for example, the US military is the single largest energy user uh, at about 1% of um, total um, energy used. And much of that is in fuel to power our forces, our aircraft, uh, in particular, and our ships. Okay, so 
How are we going to address that? We have to lead by example, and there are several ways. Um, first is militaries have often been leaders in technology, innovation, research, and development. Um, for example, in you know the internet, uh, global positioning systems, many of the, the technologies in widespread civilian use today were developed uh, first in the military. So we need to step up our game on clean energy and climate tech innovation. Uh, and we've been talking about having, you know, a defense clean energy innovation initiative or office or a major initiative to ramp up. We already have some investments in that area, but we could do a lot more. Uh, everything from smart grids uh, to electrification of vehicles. I mean, the military buys a lot of vehicles and they're not all tanks, okay? A lot of them are, are just what we call non-tactical vehicles, you know, the trucks, uh, et cetera, that are moving uh, equipment. So in p particularly in peacetime. So there's a lot of opportunity for electrification. Then um, uh, uh, different types of fuels. You know, there's a lot of research going on now on green hydrogen and other fuels. That needs to be explored uh, in, in depth. And then uh, renewables, you know, uh, in the U.S. we have uh, a lot of our housing at military bases is powered today by solar. The largest solar powered housing in the United States is on a military base. Um, and so we can do more of that, leading by example in a variety of these uh, clean technology areas. And that will have beneficial effects both to reduce energy use um, and improve performance by the military, but also to showcase how that can be done uh, in the civilian society. When I talk to our colleagues of the military in many countries, one of the response I get that if we are given the toss in the response mechanisms of climate change impacts, then we need to be re-educated or educated, and we need to be retooled for the purpose. But that is not happening in many militaries. So they are not properly trained for this purpose. They're not properly tooled or equipped for this purpose. Is that something that we should now look at? Yes, I think education should be a major uh, component of the work that we do. Uh, we need to really increase our focus, um, particularly on, on professional military education across the board. Um, you know, I recall to over 20 years ago now when I was serving at the Department of Defense, we made as um, a major effort uh, to integrate environmental security considerations into professional military education. And I spent a lot of my time at our war colleges and our uh, national defense universities and others and working with our military educators uh, to flow down environmental security education and training throughout the curricula. Everything from kind of um, uh, particular tra training on equipment and how to manage equipment to all the way up to sort of strategy um, and policy and philosophy. And I think we need a dedicated effort um, in that regard. And uh, I'm hopeful that that, will, um, that that will be a component of our work going forward. Thank you. And I also would like to bring up another issue, a major area of concern for everybody, particularly in our part of the world is the issue of sea level rise. And as we study that, uh, in many cases, I think the issues of sea level rise in some cases or many cases irreversible now. So how do you think will be the potential impacts of sea level rise? Is the international community really understanding this? Are they preparing for this? Do they have the consequence planning in their mechanisms? Because uh, I would also like to mention that about two years back, I was asked to go and give a briefing at the UN Security Council and the United Nations in New York on the security impacts of sea level rise. And I was quite surprised to see how the level of understanding was so minimum there of the grave consequences of sea level rise. So is the policy community aware of the consequences? Are they preparing the states? 
and the international community. I would like to have your thoughts on the possible consequences and what should we do? Well, I, I agree with you that the consequences could be very severe. There may be major urban coastal communities that become uninhabitable uh, within decades. And some of them are in South Asia, in your part of the world, absolutely. Um, we, we could see that in parts of the United States, parts of South Florida may be uninhabitable um, in coming decades if we don't avert um, the worst of uh, climate, of, of, of global warming and, and, and climate change. And if we don't take efforts to make our coastal communities more resilient. Now, this is going to take, I believe, a combination of um, public uh, action and dedication and leadership, but also uh, some level of market signal. Uh, for example, when I think about what's happening in the, in the U.S., I, really just now, but it should have already started really a few years ago when you look at the severity of the sea level rise risks across um, particularly the eastern seaboard of the United States, the market should be sending a signal that the pricing of real estate uh, and the insurance available for it should, should be, uh, you know, should recognize those risks. And I think that's only just beginning to happen. And some of those signals are distorted uh, because we don't have adequate uh, flooding maps um, in certain parts of the world. I'm sure that's true in certain parts of your world that the historical map uh, does no longer reflects the actual reality of the sea level rise or the storm surge or the frequency of the extreme weather event and its severity. Um, and so uh, the consequences are, are, could occur faster than the ability of humans to adapt uh, to those consequences. That's some of the real risks that we face of the climate crisis, that um, events will occur faster than we have the ability to adapt to them. Uh, and so I think raise, continuing to raise attention and awareness to this is going to be incre increasingly important. And I'm hopeful that with um, John Kerry coming into this role uh, of the Presidential Climate Envoy and raising attention to this again. It will be um, not only about how we get back and meet our particular uh, commitments, but also what those specific consequences could be. And I think sea level rise, and also let's put out there extreme heat. Uh, both of those in, in coming years are going to have deadly consequences in certain parts of the world. Yes, and uh, I also would like to mention here that one of the major consequences of sea level rise will be human displacement. Because as you know that a very large pro proportion of the global humanity lives within 100 kilometers of the sea. So we build our cities, we build our habitations, our commercial centers, all close to the sea. So in terms of the impact of sea level rise, human displacement that can trigger mass migration of climate migration of climate refugees will be a major issue and a consequence. Is the international community foreseeing this consequence? Are we preparing for this? What should we do? Okay, uh, I think this is one of the toughest questions. I, I think um, that we're beginning to see we understand, at least in the expert community, that human displacement and migration is a major consequence of sea level rise and climate change. Um, and particularly in South Asia, the low-lying regions of Bangladesh and other parts uh, of the region, you could see um, tens of thousands, if not more, um, have to be displaced or have to migrate because of sea level rise, extreme weather events. Um, combined with storm surge and coastal erosion. And um, that has, you know, we already are living in an era of the greatest wave of global migration uh, since World War II. And so I think we're beginning to understand uh, that it can happen, but I don't think we've really prepared well yet for how to cope with it. Um, and I think we're going to need to step up our game, both in understanding this and in using international institutions better to 
uh, assess and address some of the issues with climate migration, um, with definitions of, of um, refugees, and also for planning um, um, relocation strategies uh, that will have to occur both probably at the national and at the international level. Just in the U.S. already, we've seen um, several um, towns in both Alaska and in Louisiana, uh, areas of the U.S. that are hard hit by sea level rise and coastal erosion uh, have to be relocated, where the populations have had to be relocated uh, upriver or inland uh, because they can no longer, because the coastal area they lived no longer accommodates human habitation. Let me share with you some statistics about my own country, Bangladesh. According to IPCC's report, a one meter sea level rise in south of Bangladesh will mean a loss of 17 to 20 percent of Bangladesh's territory. So a country as small as Bangladesh with 170 million people, the national country strategy paper analyzes and says that it will create a climate refugee population of 25 to 30 million people. I see some reports of independent observers and analysts, the numbers they say is even higher. But even if we take the government strategy paper, it's a massive number of climate refugees. And if that happens, that Bangladesh alone will create a climate refugee population that can become a major source of destabilization and insecurity, not only to the region, but internationally. Is the world looking at this kind of problem? I don't see the awareness anywhere. Well, it certainly hasn't um, been looking at it hard enough. And in the last four years without American leadership, um, it hasn't gotten much attention at all. And I agree with you. We've been talking about this uh, now for at least a decade. And you know, from the earliest CNA Military Advisory Board reports back in 2007, we observed how serious um, the sea level rise, flooding, and migration crisis in Bangladesh could be. And it's often used as the um, kind of poster child case uh, for global refugees from climate change. And I don't think we've yet come up with a strategy and a plan, but I think it's going to be very important um, to do so in the future as part of uh, both resetting climate, uh, a climate forward um, foreign and international policy. Yeah, but let me also bring up another issue. And I would like you to educate me on this. What are the understanding of the countries that are going to vanish, disappear from the face of the earth. I'm talking about the Maldives, for example. I'm talking about the Pacific Islands. So when countries completely disappear or go under the water, what are the other legal consequences? We are not even trying to understand them now. So for example, what will be the legal rights or the EZs, for example, that they once had. What are we going to do about the maritime boundaries that has been drawn based on the baselines of the shorelines? So isn't it going to completely throw out of the window a lot of the conventions and our understanding of resources, limitations, and the boundaries? In addition to relocating the people, in many cases, the islands don't have many people, so relocation may be possible. But what happens to the other legal issues? Well, these are very important questions that I think are not yet um, well, uh, well addressed in the international legal community. As you said, some have begun to raise the issue, what happens to the sovereignty uh, of a Pacific Island nation uh, whose population is completely displaced. I mean, you have, you mentioned the Maldives, Kiribati, there are other small Pacific Island nations um, that may become uninhabitable within coming decades. First, um, for loss of fresh water, and then potentially for um, sea level rise. Countries like, um, uh, or st states like Kiribati have already been looking at at buying property in Fiji 
uh, to enable relocation of certain portions of the population there if necessary. Uh, and, and throughout the uh, South Pacific, there's discussion about what those rights might be. The U.S. as a compact of, of, of free association states. We have a number of, uh, of Pacific um, Island um, uh, territories whose populations may also be displaced and have certain rights. Now, they may have certain rights to relocate into the United States. Uh, that doesn't completely satisfy their their needs. Um, uh, and I think that there's a lot that we don't understand about how we can address that. And at the same time, we have to be mindful that we see other countries like China uh, taking advantage uh, of um, climate change effects to build up atolls and create presence uh, in the Pacific in ways that could be detrimental for our security future. So we have to we have to figure out a strategy to balance both of those deep, deep uh, concerns. Yeah, I think this is a completely gray area in which experts need to look at because I've just named a few. What happens to international obligations or the treaties they had once signed? What happens to the international obligations of monetary obligations that they had of national debt when they disappear completely? What happens to the unclosed boundaries we have built? What happens to the linguistic and the cultural security of those people and the states when they relocate? Do they preserve them or they assimilate? So there is a whole range of issues that we need to look at. And I think this is coming fairly soon because some of the Pacific Islands will be lost to us in the coming decades. And unfortunately, we haven't looked deeply enough into the issues. And maybe uh, your council or somebody can do a proper study to alert the international community and the world on this. The next thing, Sherry, I would like you to focus on, I know that you work a lot on this, the melting of the ice caps, the polar caps, is not only going to contribute to sea level rise, but it will also have other consequences. So what are the range of other consequences? Well, uh, thank you, yes. Um, you know, the Arctic is, is changing at twice the rate of the rest of the planet. The climate is changing, the temperatures are rising at twice as fast as elsewhere on the planet. This last summer, we saw temperatures of 100 degrees in Siberia and 70 degrees um, in both the Norwegian and Canadian Arctic that are unheard of. So the sea ice now has, has been at the lowest um, extent in recent decades as when it's measured in September annually each year, it was at the second lowest extent uh, this year and the, and the first lowest extent was just a few years ago. So the sea ice is on a path to retreat uh, and permafrost is thawing, which is creating hazardous and dangerous conditions for infrastructure across the Arctic, um, particularly in Russia, where you have um, about 20% of Russian GDP is derived from Arctic activities, primarily energy, oil and gas and mining. Um, so we have a changing Arctic, a whole new ocean that's opened up in our lifetime. And um, the Arctic has primarily been a zone of, of peaceful cooperation among the eight Arctic states and in the Arctic Council with a number of other observers. But now many see commercial and potentially other opportunities in the region as it becomes more navigable. Now it's still very dangerous and hazardous to operate in the Arctic. But for example, Russia under Putin has set very ambitious shipping goals up to 80 million metric tons from about approximately about 20 million metric tons today of shipping across the Northern Sea Route, which would connect uh, ports in Asia to ports in Europe. And China's Arctic policy, first released in 2018, declares itself an Arctic stakeholder and a near, a near Arctic um, power, and also observes that shipping times could be shorter across the Northern Sea Route than the, the Southern Route uh, through the Straits of Malacca and up through of the Strait of Hormuz for shipping. Now that's still many decades away, 
uh, particularly what they call what's called uh, the transit shipping from one um, from one region uh, to to another. Uh, but destination shipping, you know, shipping to these energy complexes uh, within the Arctic, particularly at Yamal, where China is heavily investing with Russia to develop uh, that um, oil and gas complex, is going to continue. So we're going to see increased exploitation, uh, ironically, in the climate era of fossil resources uh, in the Arctic. Uh, we'll see increased human activity. Uh, Russia is building up its military um, defenses, its forces, its ability to operate uh, with nuclear icebreakers and other vessels in the, in the Arctic. Other nations are doing the same. The U.S. Is, uh, had a uh, couple of aging icebreakers that it's now finally beginning uh, to uh, to rebuild with a new fleet of icebreakers, but that's still several years away. Um, and so the world, the Arctic has changed dramatically because of climate change, uh, an era of potential, uh, but not certain uh, competition among uh, major powers in the region. But also I think there, sh hopefully there will be opportunities to reduce tension in that region and to recognize uh, the importance uh, of, of the Arctic region to the people of the Arctic and to the security of the planet. Another area, area of concern is uh, our inability to reduce the carbon in the atmosphere or our inability to reduce the global temperature. Many people are now talking about the idea of implementing geoengineering to do that. Do you think it's the right technique or the right approach to implement geoengineering? You know, I think we have to reframe that question a little bit, Munir, because I, I think that, um, I think some form of um, carbon removal technologies will be, will inevitably be used in coming decades. So the issue is going to be what are the right governance regimes uh, to manage it? How can it safely be done? Uh, how can we prevent it being mis misused? Uh, I think we're going to have to look at, at that. I think we're past the point at the, now where we can say um, we're not going to use um, carbon removal technologies to avert the worst climate cri of the climate crisis. But do you have the right international policy regimes or monitoring mechanisms or international guidelines have we been able to test them from safety records, et cetera? Is the uh, international organizations looking at this or who would be the right organization to look at this? Well, that's a good question. No, I, I don't think we have the right mechanisms yet. Most of the work I've seen have been, you know, from think tanks and research organizations um, tried to bring together in some cases an integrated um, group of both experts, policymakers, um, I think it will have to be taken up in some kind of international fora. Whether the UN is the right organization to do that, uh, but, but we'll need some kind of um, multilateral fora to address it. Uh, another area, if I may draw your attention, is that the area of resource scarcity of the resource competition, it's particularly when you look at the Sahel or African region or some other areas, uh, resource scarcity and competition can trigger tension and conflict. We've seen that in Darfur, for example. We've seen implications of that for the Arab Spring. So is that an area of real concern? And is that the symptom that it could occur in other places? Yes, I think, you know, the prolonged drought that we see across much of the Sahel and the Middle East has certainly been a source of the instability and destabilization of the region. It's not the only source, but it is a primary underlying factor we've seen in everything from Darfur to uh, the Syrian uh, uprising and unrest and including in the Arab Spring. So, you know, we need to understand how prolonged drought, particularly in, the, in that region, has become a destabilizing force 
that then at times terrorists from Boko Haram and uh, Al-Shabaab have taken advantage of when vulnerable populations are put at risk because they lack food and water security and therefore can bend to the will of those um, who, who can control the resources when you have a fragile state um, that's particularly where parts of a state may be in an ungoverned situation with very scarce resources. So I think this is gonna to continue to be uh, a source of tension and, and conflict throughout uh, North Africa. It's an area where there have been some sophisticated efforts to develop strategies to integrate, um, uh, integrate sort of food and water and development considerations into rebuilding lives and livelihoods around communities in the region and parts of Europe in particular have been very involved with um, their African neighbors and counterparts to develop you know, more sophisticated but indigenous uh, and appropriate strategies. Yes, I understand that. Uh, we are coming to the end of the conversation. So the last question that I would like to ask you is you've talked about the concept of R2P2. So would you like to explain what do you exactly mean by R2P2? Well, the responsibility to protect um, uh, concept uh, was first developed as a way to um, uh, address uh, vulnerable populations and really mass atrocities occurring. And you referenced uh, some work that was done uh, by Secretary Albright and through the Holocaust Museum and recognizing my parents are ho actually Holocaust refugees. So this is something that's very close to me personally and my history. The responsibility to prepare and prevent doctrine that we developed uh, as a follow-on to that for the climate era is one that that uh, recognizes the unprecedented climate risks that we face today, as you and I have been discussing for the last hour, and then uh, the responsibility we have to prepare. As you noted well, the um, catastrophic sea level rise consequences in Southeast Asia, we have as a global community responsibility to prepare uh, for that future and as best as possible to prevent it. So that's the R2P2 concept introduced uh, at the UN Security Council uh, within the last several years. It's gotten some attention, but it really it needs a, a lot more, um, uh, it needs more development, more work, and uh, more focus uh, by countries, major leading uh, countries and institutions that want to take this on so that we can uh, leave a better world for our children. Well, Sherry, that was a fascinating discussion. Very educative, informative, at times scary. And that is exactly what it is. The issues of climate change and security touches every corner of the globe. It is not a country's problem. It is not a region's problem. It's a global problem. And the only way to cope with this is if we act as a global community in meeting the challenge of climate change and its impacts. The time is running out and we are first reaching a tipping point. Unless we act now, act on an urgent basis, perhaps we will not be able to spare our countries and the region for the catastrophic consequences that we are likely to face. Sherry, I would like to thank you for your time this evening and more so for your tremendous contribution to the cause of climate change studies and understanding. You are a global leader. You inspire all of us. And I hope you continue the good work that you're doing. I thank you all very much. I would like to give you the floor for your last thoughts. Well, I want to also thank you for your leadership. Um, it's been remarkable and has made a huge difference uh, in but not only in your region, but throughout the world where we've had the opportunity uh, to work together on a number of important efforts. And I am hopeful uh, that as we move into a, a new U.S. administration, we will, America will be back uh, and we will again be leading with you and others on um, 
climate security so we can climate proof um, and make more resilient our future. Thank you, Sherry. Stay well and stay safe. And you too. Thank you very much.